Welcome to our Leviticus teaching. We're still in Le Leviticus 11. This is kind of a postscript. Um, there, there's a whole lot that takes place in Leviticus 11 that's behind the scenes and things that I think that we really need to take a little while and take a look at. So the title of our notes is Language, Thinking Styles, and Cultural Differences. And um, I just thought, you know, in regards to thinking styles and language and all of those things, there's so many things that uh, you can misunderstand from one culture to another, from one language to another, and most definitely from one thinking style to another. Uh, all of us think one way, but that's not how the whole world thinks, and it's really not the way that the Hebrews thought uh, when they were writing the biblical text that we have. Uh, so, you know, we'll take a look at that and uh, see. Now, uh, let's see. I'll go down here. Yeah, I'm finding out who doesn't keep quiet already. So let me see here. I'll do this. See if that helps. Okay. There we go. I don't know what you all see, but I know what I see. So. Anyway, uh, number one in our notes is uh, the purpose of Yahweh's laws and commands. Um, it's, it's so that the Israelites might distinguish between the clean and the unforgiven, unfor, and the forbidden foods, rather, or as we learned in Hebrew, between the Tameh and the Tahor, uh, we're reiterating the purpose of what was just spoken in chapter 11 uh, concerning his laws and commands. So, A in our notes is to learn to distinguish between the clean, the teme, and the unclean, the tahor, the forbidden foods. Uh, it also involves a biblical concept that has rarely been, uh, well, not rarely, but has been largely in the background, if you will, uh, since the book of Genesis. Um, uh, let's see, I just uh, pushed a button and jumped ahead about 15 pages. Let me back up here a bit. My notes uh, just moved on me, so I better say where I'm supposed to be. So uh, uh, what we are to learn is to distinguish between the clean and the unclean. Uh, there's a biblical concept that's been behind the scenes all the way along. And it's actually Yahweh's ongoing process of dividing, electing, and separating. Uh, it's the pattern of Genesis, if you will. Uh, um, in the very beginning, God established patterns, and he follows patterns. And that's something we, we've talked about a little bit, but we need to talk about a whole lot more. Because the reality of it is, is that that's part of the thinking process of the Hebraic culture is they look for patterns and they pay attention to the patterns that God has established. And right from Genesis, uh, the book of beginnings, uh, this is right where God started laying the foundational uh, footprint, if you will, of how things are going to go in the future. So to sum it up, let's put it this way. In the beginning, God went through a whole series of actions of dividing, electing, and separating. Uh, he divided the dry land from the waters and, and separated them. He divided light from darkness uh, in the sense of evil from good and separated them. He divided daytime from nighttime and separated them. He divided the water vapor in the air from the condensed water that formed the seas. And he separated them. Uh, he set the minor lights in the heavens, like the stars, to designate and divide seasons. And he created man and divided uh, him and, and separated him from all other living creatures. Uh, just as eventually he would divide, elect, and separate Israel away from all the other nations on the earth. So this same process, if you will, uh, is at play in dividing, electing, and separating these foods. It's, it's the same thing. And it's a continuation. And what we'll see throughout the scripture is this very same thing. It, it never ends. Uh, uh, God divides, he elects, and he separates. 
And this chapter 11 just happens to be talking about food. Uh, throughout the typical translation for verse 47 uh, in chapter 11 says something to the effect of, for distinguishing between uh, uh, the living things that may be eaten. Actually, literally, it should say more, uh, they may separate between the clean and the unclean. It's not so much distinguishing, it's separating. It's actually going through the process. Yeah, you have to distinguish. In other words, you have to be able to identify, but we're really responsible for doing it, uh, not just distinguishing. So A and R notes here is the same process, the dividing, electing, and separating of Genesis uh, applied to foods. Now, as we're becoming more familiar, if you will, with the concepts of Torah and of Leviticus in particular, uh, we can see the important differences between word, the words distinguish and to be separate. Uh, the responsibility to know the difference between distinguish and separate is actually ours. That's our responsibility. Uh, in a world that demands political correctness, as ours does, and a tolerance of all things, distinguishing is a much milder concept than separating. Uh, distinguishing can be seen, if you will, as a preliminary step before one divides and separates. Uh, in the original Hebrew, it is quite emphatic that just knowing a difference, which is the idea of the word distinguish, is a long way away from acting on that knowledge, which is the idea of separating. We're not just to know uh, good from evil or right from wrong. We're to actively separate the two. Uh, we're to stand firmly on the side of right and good and away from the wrong and evil. And that is much harder and takes a much more uh, le higher level of commitment, if you will, uh, uh, to make that not just the distinction, but actually to make that separation. Uh, for those of you that are um, having to make those distinctions and those separations, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, you know, we, as long as it doesn't affect us personally, we're all very good at distinguishing, but when it actually becomes something that takes place in our presence or in our homes or in our relationships with others, uh, to actually uh, take that place and do the separation, um, it takes uh, a much bigger commitment. So uh, I'm going to try to explain the relationship between sin and uncleanliness and holiness and cleanliness. Uh, keep the word relationships in mind uh, during this session because it's going to be the key to grasping the, a whole new way and method of how Yahweh speaks to us through, through the scripture. Uh, be in our notes, we're talking about the relationship between sin, uncleanliness, and holiness, and cleanliness. So to get to where we need to go, we need to preface it with a discussion, if you will, of language and style of thinking, because those are the real barriers for us to cross in order for us to get to the truth. So. Number one, the impact of language and styles of thinking and understanding scripture uh, correctly. Now, I'll try to uh, keep up with this screen. There we go. Uh, I have my notes on a different screen today. And so rather than paper, I have now two computers to play with. So I'm seeing if that will actually work out better for me. We'll see. So the impact of language and styles on thinking and understanding scripture correctly. Uh, one of the most contentious debates that surrounds the scripture, of course, uh, concerns language. Uh, it's the current belief, of course, that the First Testament was written in Hebrew and the Brit Hadashah, the Renewed Covenant, the New Testament was written in Greek. Now, um, there are people that believe that it was the Brit Hadashah was written in Hebrew and then it right away converted into uh, Greek or translated into Greek. But whatever the case may be, we can be assured of this, uh, the people that were writing it 
were Hebraic thinkers. Uh, and because of that, a lot of stuff that is written and thought out from the Hebraic way of thinking uh, actually is quite different uh, from what the normal thinking is of today. And by the way, uh, that's the Hellenistic thinking, the Greek kind of thinking, uh, which became uh, prevalent through the Hellenistic Jews. Uh, and so with Yeshua, uh, that thinking was part of the world at that time, although um, the Hebraic thinking was still a vital component because God's word was written from that Hebraic perspective. And when you start thinking uh, from a Greek perspective, there's a lot of misunderstanding uh, and you have to do all the translating in your head to remember uh, what is what. So um, the, the people that were writing the letters that we have that have now formed the Brit Hadashah, uh, they were Hebraic thinkers and they wrote from that perspective. We need to really keep that in mind. Uh, so the Bible is thoroughly a Hebrew document. Um, now, uh, in regards to language, um, we asked the question of how much difference does it actually make? Well, it makes a great deal of difference, actually. Uh, it's a given in sociology and anthropology and linguistics uh, and just simple observation that language uh, is a reflection of the culture. Uh, and that any culture is embedded in its language, actually. So it becomes a reflection of the culture. Um, when uh, the Tower of Babel, for example, Yahweh divided and separated the one common language uh, into a world with many, uh, the result was uh, much farther reaching than simply just a whole bunch of people suddenly lost their ability to communicate. Uh, people who could still communicate uh, among themselves, stuck to one another and form groups, uh, probably out of necessity in reality. And then those groups separated from others, uh, which actually achieves the Lord's purpose of dispersing the population uh, around the globe. We don't often think of that uh, as what took place, but that's exactly what took place. So inevitably, through each of these language groups, uh, that were now divided, separated, and isolated by language, uh, they developed their own unique concepts and ideas of life and death, uh, morals and ethics, if you will, law and justice. Uh, their priorities and values changed and so on. Uh, they developed into their own separate people groups, nations and cultures, uh, each with their own language, customs, and values. So uh, language and culture are indelibly linked together. And so uh, when we're talking about the Hebraic culture and the Hebrew language and the Bible that we have and how it's written and put together, uh, that culture and that whole concept of being uh, thought of and utilized uh, as one uh, aspect becomes very, very important to us because what cultures end up doing is they, they have certain ways of thinking, of course, but they also use words that simply don't always uh, have a means of being translated into another language. And so we have that from the Hebraic perspective. Uh, a lot of the Greek words that the English has come from are words that are close to the meaning of the Hebrew, but not necessarily. Uh, correct. And so, you know, we have to look at that and understand that a lot of the English translation does not convey uh, the exact uh, meaning of the Hebraic phrases and terms. We've learned a lot of that in the Messianic community. And we'll talk about more of those things as we go on uh, this, uh, this evening. So uh, the unique concepts that different cultures develop are difficult to communicate to anyone outside their culture because there aren't necessarily any words 
uh, that have been invented outside of the culture to express that particular concept. And so that, that is kind of a base problem. And, um, and it definitely is a base problem. We're trying to understand the scripture. When we're trying to comprehend words meant to an ancient Hebraic people who wrote them rather than simply by what the words say uh, when translated. You can, you can translate words, uh, and we all know this. We, everybody's preached about this at one point or another. You know, in today's society, we say, oh, man, that was bad. Well, we don't mean bad. We mean it was actually good in a sense. And, you know, it was like, oh, that, you know, that was very exciting, very, uh, uh, it, had, it carries a different connotation than just the word bad. Uh, so, when you know, uh, A in our notes here, words mean more than just what they say after they've been translated. And, you know, that's, that, is a, that is an issue we have to consider. Uh, but it's not the only difficulty that we face. Uh, Hebrew culture, for example, in biblical times revolved around a certain way of thinking, uh, a way that was quite common at that time and in that area, in that era. Uh, the way information was mentally processed. Uh, was naturally reflected in the Hebrew language. And by what I mean by way of thinking is not about how humans often put different emphasis on various matters or disagree on what is important uh, or what has priority. Rather, is that the style of thinking was entirely different and how conclusions are arrived at uh, was completely different. So, be in our notes here how people think, not just the words they read, results in the conclusions uh, that they arrive at. Today, the vast majority of the world, certainly the Western world, uses a style of thinking that does not appear uh, and did not appear until after the Greeks uh, popularized it around 450 BC. And that's when the Hellenist, Hellenistic Greeks uh, were in Israel, and they began to spread their Greek uh, way of thinking uh, throughout the world, and, and it spread everywhere. Uh, what they call it today, of course, uh, uh, scholars term it as the use of rational, <clears throat> logical uh, style of thinking, and we call it Greek thinking, but uh, the correct name for it is rational, logical style. So number two in our notes, we have two styles of thought. One is rational, logical, which is Greek. Uh, the other is analogical, which is Hebrew. Now, the biblical Hebrews from before Moses up to and including those at the time of Yeshua uh, did not think in a rational, logical style uh, on a regular basis. It was part of their culture because it had been forced upon them, but they, because uh, of how the biblical text was written and put together, uh, and it was from the analogical perspective, when they thought about scripture, they were thinking from that, that direction. Um, so they operated in a school of thought, if you will, called analogical. What that means to us is that often what the Hebrew writers of the Bible meant is actually pretty well obscured by the difficulty of attempting to translate analogic Hebrew thought into modern Western thought style uh, by means of <laughs> a rational, logical based language like Greek, Latin, and English. Um, I'm going to try to explain it. Uh, the significant difference, if you will, between the two, and we'll we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, we can we can take it and get a hold on it. Um, everything in our modern Western culture, and in most of the world's cultures today, reflects a national, a rational, logical thought process, and it has for uh, at least two thousand years. So it's not going to be. Um, uh, <laughs> it's not going to be easy to understand an alternative way of thinking. Uh, but because it's important, 
in regard to understanding the way the writers of this Bible thought and what they meant, we're, we, we are going to try. So first, let's define rational, logical thought. And the definition is rational, logical thought is a systematic thought system. Um, I taught systematic theology in college, uh, and so I'm well versed in the systematic thought process. And, um, you know, for better or for worse, it's something I've definitely had to work at, and I've found that uh, almost universally, it doesn't matter who I'm listening to, most of the teaching, uh, I would say 99.9% .9 of the teaching from the Bible follows uh, the rational, logical thought process. People speak from the systematic thought um, system. So uh, this style of thinking that we all unconsciously use because we've grown up with it, it's, um, it's actually embedded in science, if you will, the so-called scientific method uh, that we were taught in grade school. Uh, uh, between the scientific method, you got to be able to uh, actually prove something to see it and to know that it works and it happens this way. Um, it's a provable thing. And the actuality is that the two can't be separated. Um, uh, it's embedded in the scientific method of cause and effect within a system structure. Um, that's number one in our notes. The rational, logical thought relies on reasoning and operates on a philosophy of cause and effect. If I do this, then the result will be that. Uh, it is systemized thought. It operates on the principle that everything exists is part of a larger system. And every system is structured so that we could break it apart into smaller and smaller subsystem and examine those subsystems separately to see how those things work. Uh, an example of that, uh, A in our notes, the example of a systematic structure could be the automobile and Western medicine. Um, the automobile has many different uh, systems. It's composed of many subsystems. It's got a motor, a transmission, a body, brakes, electrical wiring, seating, heating, air conditioning, and all of those, those are all subsystems. Uh, an engine by itself can be developed and examined completely apart uh, from the car. Uh, and so when we're dealing with uh, the scientific thought system or rational logical thought, it's what we do. We tear things apart and we look at all of the various components uh, and then we make decisions concerning uh, what, what they mean and how they operate and what, what is being, what's being said. Another example, of course, is the uh, uh, the Western medicine system, it operates under the same rationale. A uh, human body is traditionally looked at as a system. It's got many subsystems, our skeletal frame, our brain, our lungs, our digestive tract, our eyes, ears, nose, and throat, and all the other parts that are there. Um, you know, basically it works like if we have a stomach problem, we go to the person uh, that knows about stomachs. And so, you know, that's a cause and effect. We go to that in that direction looking for things. So, and that's all, you know, that's all well and good. Uh, but Western medicine does not see, if you will, uh, a soul as a separate part or subsystem of a human being. Rather, the soul is simply part of the brain function. Uh, like a soul is a belief, for example. Uh, rationally, logically, it is really nothing more than a result of how our brain works. Um, however, hebraically, we have a whole different perspective. So um, rationally and logically, there is no identical part of a human uh, that can be separated out and examined or repaired uh, 
is called a soul. Within the Hebraic thought process, uh, there is a soul. And I don't even want to go into the concept of a spirit uh, because there's no meaning in modern Western medicine uh, about a spirit, um, at least not in the um, typical uh, Western medicine anyway. So rational, logical thought is generally broken down into two main reasoning. Uh, one of them is inductive and the other is deductive. So number two in our notes, um, rational, logical thought has two main types, inductive and deductive. Deductive reasoning operates on combining a series of hard, cold facts, if you will, in order to achieve or reach a, a conclusion. Uh, uh, fact one for, this is an example, all dogs have four legs. Fact two, Rover is a dog, conclusion, Rover has four legs. That's that's extremely simple, but it's basically gathering the facts, uh, identifying what rover is, and you come to the conclusion. Inductive reasoning, however, does not seek to achieve that kind of a mathematical certainty uh, as deductive reasoning does. Rather, inductive reasoning occurs when we gather bits and pieces of information together and then combine it with our life experience and our knowledge in order to make an observation about what seems to be true. Uh, this would be an example of inductive reasoning, for example. Uh, Being a notes, by the way, is inductive reasoning combines facts with knowledge and experience to make an observation. This would be the example of an observation. John came to Clay late this morning. That was the first observation. Observation two, John's hair was messy. Uh, the, our experience with John is John's hair is usually neat and combed. So the conclusion could be John must have overslept. Uh, when we observe people and deal with people, we tend to use inductive reasoning in making our conclusion. Yet whether inductive or deductive, it all is still based on rational, logical thinking. So rational, logical thinking, we can think of as being linear and evolutionary. In other words, A leads to B and B leads to C. Uh, rational, logical thinking always asks why. Um, rational, logical thought says that history is a straight line that starts with some undefined point in the past and goes until infinity and that history is not repeating and the past is not a predictor of the future. And for those that have rational logical thinking, patterns do not exist from a historical standpoint. Now, the things I'm saying, uh, they can be picked apart and there's always nuances, you know, a little bit here, left and right. But I'm trying to give a simple, clear uh, presentation that hopefully we can then uh, begin to identify as being uh, what rational, logical thinking is. And so three in our notes is that it's linear and evolutionary. A to B, B to C. Y is you ask how and then you determine what. So, so the thing about rational logical thinking is that it operates best in a vacuum, if you will, uh, away from relationships and connections to other things uh, that might be similar that happened previously. Uh, truth and relevance are pragmatic. That is in the re relational logical thinking style, the question of why something happened is defined by how something happened and then by exactly what happened. Uh, it's somewhat of a narrow search for relevant information because it pertains to a specific event at a specific time. The past and future have no relevance to one another and little if any relevance to the current situation. So A in our notes, uh, rational logical thinking focuses on specific events 
events and times, not historical patterns. So let me move our notes up here so I don't get, I don't have them whoop, down too far. All right. Uh, let me see here if I can, you know, I've I lose my, there it is. I don't know if that was in your way or not. I just moved something off of my screen. It may not have been something you saw, but it was interfering with what I was able to see. So um, from this, let's, uh, as prevalent, <clears throat> excuse me, as prevalent as Greek thinking is in our culture, rational logical thought is by no means completely universal, even by today's standards in our current world. Uh, Asian cultures, for example, still utilize analogical thought, and because of the difference in thought styles, Western Greek thinking cultures have a hard time understanding, if you will, uh, Asian cultural and business practices, uh, and most definitely political ideology. Rational logical thought is not necessarily better or more advanced than analogical thought, it is simply different. And it's practically the opposite, actually, uh, of how they work. Uh, so it's not something whereby we made a conscious decision to choose to think in one style or another. The rational, logical style of thought is present in all of us because we're surrounded by it and taught it uh, in our culture. So now as we move on to explain analogical thought, uh, the type of thought the writers of the Bible use, uh, let me say this, there is absolutely nothing wrong or ungodly per se, nor faulty about the rational logical thought style, the Greek thought style, provided we acknowledge that it is not the only style in the only way of thinking, and that it does have built-in limitations. For instance, for instance, the universe is created by Yahweh, uh, as created by Yahweh, doesn't necessarily operate in a rational, logical way. And try as scholars and scientists have, have tried uh, to pound uh, <laughs> square pegs into round holes, it just does not work the way that people think that it does not from a rational standpoint anyway. I uh, gotta remember a rational logical thinking uh, basically is birthed from being a man-centered uh, way of thinking, is totally dependent on factoring in the four dimensions that are observable to uh, in our universe. We're talking about length, width, height, and time. Uh, the belief is that only things that can be scientifically observed and tested are real. It relies on the power of the human mind to discover and then to use those discoveries to make decisions and judgment. Uh, what cannot be proved by logic and reason is considered to be invalid. So B, the, the definition, if you will, for analogical thought, operates in conjunction with established patterns and, my, and models, excuse me. So it operates in conjunction with established patterns and models. Want to make sure I'm at the right place here. Okay. okay, all right. I needed to find, make sure I'm still with my notes because I can, I have a tendency to go on and forget about the notes. So I didn't want to make sure we had forgotten about them entirely. So, so now analog analogical thinking uh, is entirely different in the fact that it operates based on established patterns in models. Analogical thinking searches for <clears throat> and recognizes common foundational truths that are shared between similar things, even though those particular th similar things may not be completely alike. 
Uh, for example, a bird and an airplane. Uh, they are not exactly alike, but they share uh, similar things in the fact that they both have wings and they're able to fly. So that, you know, you can see that there's a connection there between the two. Um, and the connection is they're both aerodynamically able to function uh, in flight. Um, they're quite different, and there are lots of things that are different about them, but uh, you can see that there is a connection. So one, in our notes, analogical thinking relies on relationships and connections to establish meaning. Uh, for instance, notice, if you will, we've been reading in the Torah, and especially in Leviticus, uh, Leviticus does not attempt to explain the reason for each new law or instruction. Rather, another but similar law or instruction is added to the mix, and then another, and then another. The relationship between all of these laws and instruction creates an overall picture that establishes the meaning. So, you know, if, if you're uh, like many of us that want to know why, um, the answer is simply because it conforms to the underlying principle behind all the other laws. In other words, <laughs> why can't we eat pork? Well, because it conforms the underlying principle behind the, all the other laws. And the laws that God laid down in Genesis, uh, God has built upon them, and we're going to see that all the way through. Uh, God separates, uh, and he chooses to do that uh, on his, for his purpose. And so the separation and things that are forbidden, the things that are utilized in certain ways, they all have an inner connection uh, through different patterns and models. So uh, A in our notes, the original Genesis pattern is a context of conformity for future progressive transformation. Uh, we can see all the way through the biblical text uh, that there's been transformations of God's uh, laws, but they all have followed the same pattern. And we'll be able to see that, and I think you'll be able to identify it, which in some regards, I think it'll be exciting for us. So uh, we find that Yeshua's parables are, are examples of a particular analogical style of thinking. Yeshua spoke often in a particular kind of thought style that was called parables. And it embodied in his sometimes puzzling parables, uh, there were spiritual principles and patterns that exist and never change. He got his point across by applying principles of established and understood patterns to other th things that didn't on the surface seem similar. But when you take them apart and you look and you realize that he's talking about things that everybody already had understood biblically, but used a story to convey it, uh, he is uh, actually speaking uh, from an analogical uh, perspective. So the... the uh, you know, even when he's talking about, you know, uh, running out of oil to keep your lamp burning until it is returned, it, it is a long established spiritual pattern and principle that he's actually referring to. And those that thought as he thought would have no trouble at all understanding exactly what he was talking about. So the thing about analogic thinking is that it must have a pre-existent original pattern from which to progress and model itself after. So that's B in our notes. So the important issue in the analog analogical thinking style of biblical characters is which pattern is true and relevant to this current situation. Um, that is number one. 
uh, which pattern is a true and relevant one that's showing itself in this situation. When we, when we look at things that are going on uh, from the analogical perspective, we do look for patterns. Uh, this year, I talked a great deal about the patterns that I was saying that God had laid out for us and bringing us to this point, uh, the sequestering and all of that, uh, all of the anti-Semitism that was so prevalent in our world, um, seeing that the 40-day pattern, if you will, the 70-year pattern, uh, the 50-year pattern, all of those things converging uh, during the, the past three months uh, in which we've been uh, sequestered and dealing with all of this stuff that has been going on in, in our own uh, world right now. Well, those are looking for patterns. And once you see the pattern, then you go and you realize this pattern has repeated itself multiple times. And what does the pattern, what was the original intent of the pattern? How was it uh, first expressed in the scripture? And as it's been subsequently expressed over time, what has that uh, taught us? And how is it that we're supposed to respond when we see that pattern? So and an anal analogical thinking, it's which pattern is the true and relevant one for the situation that we're in. And that's something we really need to start paying attention to uh, because it, it holds the secrets, if you will, uh, of what God is trying to communicate to his people, uh, not only in the past, but today and in our future. We, we can see all of this uh, being manifest for us. So therefore, in the Greek style of thinking, the search is always for why. But in the Hebraic style, the biblical style of thinking, the search is always for which. Uh, upon recognizing which pattern fits a particular uh, regulation or circumstance, the meaning then becomes clear. Analogical thinking also tends to see things, uh, if you will, as uh, microcosms, uh, a little world all into itself a miniature universe, if you will, that's a model of a larger and more elaborate one. A family, for instance, is a microcosm of a community. Uh, family is but a miniature-sized group of people that is similar in principle and structure to a larger grouping of people called a community. And so when you, when you, uh, talk and teach and minister uh, God's word, uh, you can uh, identify the small, if you will, uh, microcosm uh, and extrapolate that to say, okay, within the family, if you have this problem uh, uh, or this situation going on, if you expand that out to the community, uh, what's 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 problematic within the family is hugely problematic within the whole community. So that, that's how that kind of works. So see in our notes, analogical thinking views things from a microcosm's viewpoint and then projects. It projects it out uh, looking at the larger groups uh, in which uh, things need to be dealt with. So. Number one, miniature size groups, families, are models, if you will, for larger community groups. Now, hopefully, if we're getting a little bit of understanding concerning the basics of the problem, uh, let's get to the practical terms of what this means to us in the study of Torah. We know that Hebrew is a language embodying a culture, if you will, of analogical thinking. On the other hand, uh, Greek is a language embodying a culture of rational, logical thinking. Uh, Hebrew is a completely separate culture with a completely unique language uh, designed to communicate 
the Hebraic unique concepts and the Hebrew, Hebraic concepts that we see in the Bible. Uh, and they're based on the mind of God, if you will, and the information he gave to them and them alone in the form of the Torah and then, of course, later in, in the scriptures that we now have. Greek, on the other hand, is a widespread and variant culture with a unique language that was designed to communicate its particular cultural concepts and principles. Greek culture is based on human discovery, human philosophy, science, and technology, and man-made systems of morality and truth. Uh, how does a Greek system of thinking and problem-solving, uh, rational, logical thinking extract truth and meaning from an entirely opposite system of thinking? Uh, well, that is uh, our problem. So in a nutshell, rational, logical uh, thinking asks why and is the basis for our scientific method of discovery. It believes that history is a straight line and that history has little or no inherent bearing on the present or future, except in a linear evolutionary fashion. Um, with the primitive, therefore, leading to the more advanced. Now, we've all kind of fallen into that, and we thought, well, you know, what the Hebraic people were doing way back there was pretty primitive, and, you know, we've moved far ahead, and so we're, we have a more advanced culture today, so that's why we won't be doing any of those things they did previously. However, we find out when we read the text, that the sacrifices, for example, that they were making, uh, the five that we've already studied, uh, in the millennium, uh, there will be those kind of sacrifices being made again. And it doesn't make any sense if you're thinking of things from a rational, logical point of view. Because that was in the past, and of course that was primitive. We're moving into the future that's going to be more advanced. But from the Hebraic uh, analogical thinking, um, we got to realize God established a pattern, and the pattern has meaning. And so to go back to the pattern to teach the meaning uh, seems to be a very logical thing to think that, okay, that's what God is going to do. He's going to take us back and show us the pattern so that we can begin to view things and understand things from his perspective, as opposed from just the perspective of men. And so um, the question of which pertains to which pattern or which model is a current circumstance operating within, uh, why that pattern or model is, is as it is, is secondary. And while at times it may be nice to know, uh, it's irrelevant and the decision-making process. So once again, uh, when we're talking about ancient Hebrew thinking, um, it is that style of thought that's expressed in the Bible. Irrational, logical thinking is not a wrong or evil thing, but if we're going to understand our Bibles, then we need to grasp that to approach the study of Holy Scriptures, asking why, or to try to structure and test uh, via the scientific method, if you will, ancient theological principles and law that that were written down in analogical thinking uh, is not is going to lead to confusion and downright error. And truthfully, uh, as we can find out, it has. And so, you know, uh, our whole process here is to go back and look and say, okay, how can how can we better understand God's word. Um, see in our notes is abandoning why uh, in search of which pattern Yahweh is working through now. Uh, since we're currently in Leviticus, we can begin to look at its central topic, if you will, which is sacrifice. Sacrifice entails the principles of God's creation and his ordained pattern for the universe. So that's number one in our notes, the principles of God's creation 
and his ordained pattern of the universe. Everything about the system of sacrifice follows a model that we established as early as the Garden of Eden, which then got expanded and clear at Mount Sinai, and then it got expanded and clear yet again uh, with the Wilderness Tabernacle. Uh, the Wilderness Tabernacle provides for a physical model of holiness that humans can see and comprehend and even interact with, if you will. The tabernacle, we all know, is split into three zones of different degrees of holiness. You have the Holy of Holies. It's at the innermost part where God's presence resides. And A in our notes here is we have three zones of different degrees of holiness that models a basic foundational pattern. Now, in the Holy of Holies, only Yahweh and his appointed servant, the high priest, can enter that place of the highest holiness. Uh, a barrier, a curtain, divides the holy place from another zone called the holy place, a zone of lesser holiness. The common priest may go in there, uh, but that is as close as they can get to the presence of God. And then finally, outside, another barrier that the Bible calls the door into the tent is a third zone of holiness, the courtyard that surrounds the tabernacle. Into this courtyard, the ordinary people of God, Israel, are welcome to enter in order to bring their sacrifices to Yahweh. Now, only Israelites are permitted in this area, uh, no Gentiles. <clears throat> And that's because, by definition, a Gentile at that time, if they were a Gentile, had not been declared holy by the Lord. While this third zone, the courtyard, is a zone of least holiness, you got to remember, it is still holy. Okay? So we got our notes here. A, it says the three zones of different degrees of holiness that models the basic foundational pattern. And this is a pattern. We have the most holy space. Uh, we have the reserved holy space. We have the open holy space. Then we have outside the camp. Now, I put in outside the camp because it's important for us to understand we have three degrees of holiness, and then we have a complete removal from outside the camp, or to outside the camp, if you will, uh, which removes whatever from the holiness that is inherent within the camp. So when we look at the, uh, the tabernacle, for example, uh, the man-made structure, the tabernacle was constructed according to a blueprint given by, uh, to Moses by Yahweh himself. And it simply modeled that which was already in existence. Mount Sinai, uh, the hand of God, not human hands, built Mount Sinai. And it too consists of three zones of holiness. The summit was the zone where God's presence rested, and only Moses was allowed to go up there. Uh, this was the holiest place, not only on Mount Sinai, but also on planet Earth at that time. The next holiest, holiest zone was the slope on the side of the mountain. Only Aaron and his sons, uh, the future high priests and common priests, and on occasion the 70 elders who were the government of Israel were allowed to go up on the side of the mountain. At the bottom of the mountain was a barrier, a rock wall, which separated the holiest and the holy zones from the area of the least holiness, which was at the bottom of Mount Sinai where God's people the ordinary Israelites could congregate and worship. Now, outside of those three zones, the holiness of space ended. We've talked, you know, uh, the idea being that uh, we can see that God has established patterns. He established them right from the Garden of Eden uh, at Mount Sinai in the tabernacle in the temple, uh, and if we follow it far enough, we'll, you can see that even with you and I, there is a following of that pattern of holiness. So, and we can talk about that at another time. 
So number one in our notes, the pattern, the most holy space, reserved holy, open holy, then outside the camp. This is why the term outside the camp is so important for us to get. Um, we can see the uh, uh, characteristics, if you will, of this pattern. We have the most holy is either the uppermost, the highest point of Mount Sinai, if you will, or the innermost, the holy of holy. Holy itself is intermediary, a middle zone or a buffer zone, if you will, uh, it, which would be represented by the slope of the mountain or the room of the tent, which borders the holy of holies. Uh, on one side in the outer court, the least holiness place on the other. The least holy is either outermost, the outer courtyard of the tabernacle, or lowermost, the base of Mount Sinai, uh, beyond the area where the Israelites are inside the camp, uh, and therefore common, and therefore not sanctified, and therefore not holy. Now, that's not too hard to see. We can see that. We can, we can see that pattern. Uh, we can see it, it. It carries all the way through. Uh, we... We see it uh, structured in the priesthood. The high priest is the most holy. Uh, then we have the common priest are holy. Then we have the Levites. And so we have, you know, that we're not priests, but we're set apart by God's people. So, you know, this same holiness pattern uh, goes throughout everything that God has done. And so when we are awakened to it, and we began to look for it, then we can actually see it. And that's, that's the beauty of learning these things, is that when we go through um, the scripture, we can begin to pick up this pattern and realize, oh, that's why that's part of what we're doing. Um, I mean, even so much as the sacrificial animals, uh, the parts, if you will, uh, that were placed... Uh, let me get rid of this again here. I get these little things. Uh, the parts of the animal that were sacrificed. First the head was placed on the altar, then the fat, and then the entrails. So uh, at the summit, if you will, the top is the entrails, uh, the most holy part. Under that is the fat, and under that is the head. Um, you would think, well, the head should be the, the most important, but it's not. It's from what's on the inside. Uh, it's from what's on the inside. It's not what's in your head. Uh, that's a Greek way of thinking. Oh, it's all in your head. Well, no, it's what comes from on the inside of you that makes you clean, if you will, uh, as Yeshua was saying. Not what you eat necessarily. Okay. So um, we can see that we have these three zones. Uh, and they are uh, repeated over and over and over. So A in our notes, if you will, we have these three zones, which, um, uh, the, which pattern applies. Well, we had it at, at Eden. We had it at the Garden of Eden. We had it at Mount Sinai. We have it at the tabernacle, the temple, the priests, believers in Yeshua. They all mo model God's pattern. Now, this fits in with analogical thinking. This is the thinking style of the Hebrews. The answer to why is because it all conforms to God's ordained patterns. Uh, with this knowledge, uh, we can then begin to try to understand Torah's rules concerning food. Uh, number two in our notes here, identifying patterns that tie current events to God's progressive transformation. Uh, that's analogical thinking. Uh, that's basically um, what I think I was doing. Not that I'm so smart that I know and I can just transfer over. Don't, don't, don't start believing that. But I discover these things after I'm doing them. I mean, it's like, God begins to show me things and wants me to do something. And so I do it. And then, and I'm, I'm being straight up honest with you, I'm discovering what I did uh, during our sequestering time and during uh, the things that I had written 
uh, previous to Shavuot and then at the Shavuot service, I'm discovering what I did after, not before. I didn't know any of this stuff before. Uh, as I'm studying through Leviticus, I'm, I'm coming across this stuff and I'm thinking, well, wait, wait, we just did that. Unbeknownst to me, uh, I was following a pattern that God had established uh, from, from the very beginning and that the Hebraic people think of in regards to trying to identify, find the patterns. And then when you find the patterns, you can understand uh, what's actually going on and what the pattern actually means. So um, discerning patterns ties current events to God's progressive transformation. Uh, that's analogical thinking. Uh, and so when we're talking about the dietary laws, uh, we realize they were put there primarily to continue the holiness pattern uh, that we've just been discussing. Uh, if one looks at the Old Testament writings, if you will, the First Testament writings uh, of the sages, the subject of cast root, uh, kosher eating, dominates their thoughts. And you, you ask yourself, well, why? Why is it? Uh, why is it so important? Uh, well, because it models the holiness pattern of our as our reminder to stay aware, uh, aware of God's holiness. Uh, holiness is the primary purpose for Yahweh's establishment of the laws uh, of Kashrut. Uh, you know, for the most part, uh, the Greek thinkers I uh, have not been able to come to any kind of a biblical conclusion as to why God has restricted our eating. I mean, they come up, I mean, we've heard all kinds of reasons, but none of them are, are actual. Uh, the idea that, oh, well, if you eat these things because they're bottom feeders or they eat garbage or they eat this or that, that it's for your health reasons. Well, let me remind you. Uh, Asia, the whole oriental culture, they eat things that you haven't even thought of eating. And they live a long time. It had, so it had nothing to do with eating for your health. Um, and so those people that say, well, you know, you shouldn't eat this because it causes this, this, and this. Uh, that is, I'm sorry to say, baloney. Uh, you can eat all kinds of things on this, on this planet, uh, and they aren't going to harm you. Some of them will, but for the most part, if you learn how to cook them, like uh, the Japanese have learned how to eat puffer fish, which are extremely deadly, but they know how to cure the poison aspect of it or whatever, and people eat it. Um, you know, it's not kosher, and it's not what you should be doing, but as far as being able to eat it, it can be eaten. Uh, and so God is not trying to prevent you from eating stuff that's going to make you sick or whatever. It follows a pattern. Matter of fact, the sacrificial animals, if you will, all fall into the same category of those foods that God says you can eat. So. There's a pattern there that identifies the holy. And so number one in our notes here is holiness is the primary purpose for Yahweh's establishment of the laws of Kashrut. Leviticus 11.44 says, uh, For I am Yahweh your God, therefore consecrate yourselves and be holy, for I am holy. Do not defile yourself. Well, God wants you to be holy as he is holy. Uh, what he wants for sacrifices uh, is what he has determined is what should be brought to him. And he's saying, these are the things that I would have you to eat as well. He wants you and he's protecting you, trying to keep you as holy as he is 
in this dimension of food, if you will. Uh, B in our notes, Leviticus 11.47, uh, when it's talking about uh, the purpose of the cash root laws, its purpose is to distinguish between the clean and the unclean and be clean between the creatures that may be eaten and those that may not be eaten. Uh, God is all about uh, having us follow the pattern that he has established. And it all has to do with the pattern of holiness from the most holy uh, to the holy and to the least holy, if you will. Um, so, um, we've uh, is established, if you will, this, this one pattern uh, uh, that Yahweh created for mankind. And this pattern was created, if you will, by employing one of the most basic governing dynamics God uses for dealing with his creation. And um, when we want to uh, comprehend these kosher eating requirements, uh, we can begin by adopting the mind of the Hebrew biblical writer, which means that our only hope is to search for which God-ordained pattern applies to foods, a pattern that connects to the Lord, clean and unclean designation. Well, so as we talked about earlier in our study, the most, in our notes, the most basic governing dynamics God uses in dealing with his creation is division, election, and separation. Now, uh, all of us have sat under pastors for quite a while, and uh, this pastor has done this, uh, and I have done it because it is what pastors do on one hand, but we have to, uh, we have to kind of back up a little bit here and readdress some things perhaps. Uh, perhaps the greatest cry, if you will, within the Christian community is the constant call for unity. Uh, almost every pastor uh, seeks to have unity within the congregation. Um, and, you know, at times when unity uh, from the from the context of the rational, logical viewpoint, when unity is not uh, being achieved, uh, we actually use that uh, as an excuse for uh, excommunicating somebody, for example. Uh, they don't agree with us in what we believe, and so they're, they're causing division and, uh, you know, is, is not conducive to being of one mind, so, so on and so forth. Um, so let, when I say this, what I'm going to say, it may um, be a little uncomfortable for some of us, but what we have to understand is that the God of creation actually moves forward using division and separation. Uh, to accomplish his goals. The term unity is only found uh, seven times in the entire scripture. Five of them are in the Breed Hadashah. Now, under, number one, understanding unity from the biblical perspective uh, through the meaning of a kod is, is where we need to go. In Hebrew, the word being translated as unity is actually echad, and it means oneness. It is a reference to God's character and essence and to man's ideal relationship with God. And I emphasize with God. As such, the concept of echad, unity, really needs to be applied more in a spiritual context than in a physical context. Uh, a, a, the definition for a cod is oneness in reference to God's character and essence and to man's ideal relationship with God. 
uh, in the uh, Brit Hadashah, the Greek word used for this same concept is uh, of unity, is uh, henates. Uh, and indeed, it means unity, but more in a sense of a unanimous agreement rather than oneness. The Hebrew concept of unity, akkad, brings with it the idea of joining together organically. In other words, literally growing together, thus creating an inseparable union that completes and creates wholeness, which is perhaps the chief attribute of holiness. Uh, there doesn't appear to be a word in Greek that properly translates the uniquely Hebrew concept of a god. Uh, Enotes is close, but it doesn't carry the full meaning. Now, that said, the Hebrew principle of Ikad, oneness, is undoubtedly what is try, it's trying for. Uh, now, in context, every instance in the New Testament whereby unity is called for is in regard to man's relationship with Messiah, not with other men. So number two in our notes, a cod in context is unity between God and men, not men and God. Uh, any sense of unity among men as regards the concept of a cod is about each individual's union with Yeshua. It's like the hub of a wheel. Every spoke goes out to the outer ring, which holds the whole wheel together. But it Every individual spoke does not touch another spoke. It touches the hub, and then it goes out and supports the whole uh, of the wheel. And so what we have to see here is that um, the unity that Ikad is speaking of is the unity in relationship to man's uh oneness, if you will, uh, with God. So uh, John 14, 6, for example, Yeshua said to him uh, in regards to this concept, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes through the Father but through me. In other words, your oneness with God is through Yeshua. And your oneness between brothers and sisters, if you will, is also through Yeshua. Now, you can come into an agreement with each other, but we must remember the major principle here is still one that is being employed. God separates, divides, and he does that on purpose, which indicates, and what we have to understand is, if my opinion does not gel with your opinion, it doesn't mean that because we, we don't agree wholeheartedly on everything, that we can't have a oneness. God is bigger than me agreeing with you. You may understand something, I may understand something, and we may actually appear to be opposites. But being opposite doesn't necessarily mean that I am wrong or you are wrong. It's just a way of looking at things and modeling and finding the pattern, if you will, uh, that is the basis of why we believe certain things. So with that being said, uh, that brings us to the end of this particular session. Um, and I, I would just like to say that uh, where we're at right now, uh, there is more to say on this subject. <laughs> I know you all get excited about that, but uh, there's a lot more to say. Now, let me unmute people if I can find out how to do that. Or can you, um, let me see. 